Lebanon is a very small country. Think of the state of Delaware in size. It has a population of nearly 4 million people. In Lebanon, there are 17 religious sects that over the years have kept a delicate to very difficult balance. A terrible civil war in the mid-70s through to 1990 brought destruction to much of the Lebanese society. Today, keeping the balance with all these sects continues to be tentative and full of risk. For example, with the assassination of Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri and other assassinations primarily in the Christian communities, the weight of incrimination has fallen on Syrian influence. Lebanese Christians represent almost 40% of the overall population and are distinguished by 12 sects. It is estimated that 60% of the Lebanese people are Muslim, both Shiite and Sunni. Most Palestinian refugees are Sunni Muslims. Many Lebanese are wary of an increase in the Sunni population in general. The South Lebanese army, allied with Israel, occupied the southern security zone for over 20 years until the year 2000. Earlier, the rightist Falange forces were allied with Israel's invasion in 1982, when the world learned of the massacre of over 1,500 people in Sabra Shatila camp on the edge of Beirut. Today, some in Lebanon continue to say, why should we be responsible for the Palestinian refugee problem, now 57 years old and without resolution, when it is for the international community to resolve? We will visit seven of the 12 Palestinian refugee camps of Lebanon, crossing the country from Tripoli in the north to Tyre in the south and to the Beka Valley in the east. We will meet refugee camp residents, observe conditions and services, meet camp leadership, and then return to Beirut to participate in the annual events that bring international delegations to Lebanon as part of the activities around the Sabra Shatila massacre anniversary. In 1948, the State of Israel was formed. Also in 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were displaced and expelled from their lands, villages, and homes. Palestinians call this a Nakba, the catastrophe. Of the 750,000 displaced Palestinians, 100,000 fled across the northern border to Lebanon. Today, there are well over 4 million Palestinian refugees registered by UNRWA, the United Nations Works Relief Agency. These refugees continue to live in 59 refugee camps dispersed in the occupied West Bank, Gaza, in Jordan, Syria, and in Lebanon. There have been four generations of Palestinians born in the Lebanon camps. Palestinian refugees are the world's oldest unresolved refugee community. They remain stateless after nearly 60 years. There are 12 refugee camps in Lebanon. UNRWA registers over 400,000 Palestinians with more than 200,000 refugees living in these camps. Burj al barajne a camp of 20,000 residents, is located near the Beirut airport. Most of the camp residents come from the Galilee region of northern Palestine. This is the entrance of Burj al barajne Yeah, the west entrance of Burj al barajne There is another entrance which is east entrance. Living conditions for the Palestinian refugee are dismally poor. Factors contributing to these poor living conditions are the general destruction of the camps during the Lebanese civil war and during the Israeli invasions. Over the years, there has been repeated internal displacement of Palestinians. The camps of Tel Zatar and Nabatiya were totally destroyed by fighting in the civil war and not rebuilt. In addition, there is the general deteriorating economic condition in Lebanon, which contributes to poor camp conditions. The forced exodus of the PLO in 1982 meant that all affiliated social institutions left as well. The Palestinian refugee was left vulnerable to attack by punitive Lebanese militias. 
UNRWA services already inadequate to meet the needs of the refugee population now face funding cuts even as the Palestinian refugee population grows. Palestinian refugee camps are above all overcrowded. There is a lack of adequate garbage collection. Narrow alleyways are dark and without sunlight, as are most camp dwellings. There is a lack of proper ventilation, poor sewer systems, poor water supply, and there's an insufficient makeshift electrical service. This lack of basic infrastructure affects everyone and guarantees the presence of diseases. He was killed by the Israelis uh, through uh, their guns uh, from the borders of Palestine to Lebanon. He and one from Shatila also, two, they were killed there. And they were uh, non -gun, no guns, nothing with them. And they didn't throw any stones on them. Nothing. They didn't do anything. They just would like to see the They wanted to see Palestine. They wanted to see their land, their own land. What uh, what is what was his name? Shadi, name Shadi and Anas. Shadi, Shadi and Anas. This is the mother. What's your name? Huh? Marwa. Marwa. What's your name? No. What's your name? And what's the little girl's name? Back. What's her name? Mariam. Aha. Uh -huh. Mariam <laughs> Okay, very, very nice. Very nice. Shukran. Shukran. <laughs> so now we are leaving Burj Al Arab. You see here, this is Sunni mosque, that is Shiat mosque. Sunni and Shia. Sunni and Shia. Ah. But Dawi camp has 16,000 residents and is located near the northern city of Tripoli. Hey. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Palestine, yeah. Palestine. Palestine. Let me see what you have here. Uh, it's Palestinian and Arabic. Palestinian and Arabic. Yeah. Let me see this again here. Palestine? Okay. Yeah. Bush always talk about, about freedom, yeah? yeah? And he don't know anything about he freedom. Know. Not stupid. He have a div in his head. Yeah? Yeah, wait up. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, okay. Nice to meet you. Al Association is a community managed women's program operating in all the refugee camps. It runs a skills training center for women. It also provides workshops dealing with family and gender issues. Poverty and a dense population make domestic violence an issue of special concern. The main reason that the violence or the, the domestic uh, violence is happening in our camp, especially this particular camp, is economically and uh, unemployment. That's the main reason why it's, uh, the domestic uh, abuse is, uh, and violence is taking place. I'll give you an example. On my personal uh, life, from my personal perspective, uh, when I first got married, I married to a guy who was unemployed. So my marriage was not stable. I mean, he's, he's a good guy. He's nothing wrong with him. He's stable. However, the unemployment caused a lot of uh, marriage problem between him and I. Uh, the problems got solved later on after he found employment because he found himself useful and he's producing and that was the problems were solved after he was employed but it took us a while to, uh, to, to resolve those, prob those problems. Now also we'll find the psychological impacts on the children as well because of an unemployment because also the employment comes also in stages. Sometimes they find work temporary and then they go out of work. So this kind of the uh, lack of consistency 
that also causes a lot of uh, psychological problems on the kids. So we find also the kids having a, a big impact on the kids psychologically. Also the lack of um, uh, the facilities uh, that is available and the resources, which is the playgrounds and all that, all, uh, and there's a lot of psychological pressure on, on them and, uh, you know, they, you find them all the time under a tremendous kind of pressure. So that's why it's, you know, the abuse is right there because of the lack of resources and lack of availability uh, of the playgrounds and like normal kids what they should have. Non-governmental organizations such as Beit Atfal al Sumud offer kindergartens in the camps. NGOs also provide mobile clinics and preventive health services like mother-child support. Some centers have computer training classes and other vocational services. As I said, uh, well, supported by the RKK Japanese people, and this clinic for the it's for free for the all the kindergarten and the dairy camp, and uh, for the children. Three to six years. <laughs> Anyhow, we are, we are human beings. I'm just yes. yes. So, for the youngest one, and here KG1. KG1. This is a kindergarten? And yeah, kindergarten. Yeah, you can, uh, can. UNRWA educational services are inadequate. UNRWA provides only 10 years of education and classes are overcrowded with few to no facilities such as labs, computers or libraries. A consequence of this poor educational system is the high illiteracy rate and more than half of all Palestinian refugees do not finish basic education. Nahr al Barid camp is located near Tripoli, situated on the main road that takes you from Lebanon to Syria. The camp was established in 1950. In the beginning, there were tents, basic tents. Most of the people who occupied the camp were from the Galilee, the northern part of Palestine, from Haifa, Akka, and Safad. Palestinians from the 1948 expulsion have lived nearly 60 years as stateless people in the Lebanon camps. My name is Jamil Ismail Hamad. I am 70 years old man. I used to live in Palestine in a place called Safsaf. Safsaf is a suburb of Safad. It's a small so, uh, it's on the outskirt of uh, Safad. If you can imagine, Safad is just like Beirut, and Safsaf is just the outskirt of a place called Safad in Palestine. We used to have a land, and we're farmers. We used to uh, uh, plant uh, olives, figs, uh, wheat. This is was our main income. The war started. Of course, the weapons, the main, mainly Israel had the main weapon, and that's why they beat us, because they had the uh, stronger weapon. Because of that, uh, people start running away. We were four boys. So when the war started, you know, out of the four sons, we were four. Uh, we've lost two of my brothers, and I lost my father. So when the war started, I remember this is very clearly as a child. 
Uh, they called all the men, about 60 uh, men, they come to every house, they just collectively, with their, with their weapons, come out from your homes and they just collected uh, all the men, taking them out of their homes. So when they called the, the men out, they put them against the wall and as a child, as again, this picture cannot get out of my mind. I remember it so clearly that they, they brought them against the wall with their hands up and they were facing the wall. And there was an automatic uh, automa uh, machine gun with the Israeli uh, soldier, uh, the, Ju the Jewish guy uh, gave the orders and the Israeli uh, soldier, he just went randomly and just shot all those 60 men right there when uh, you know uh, bullets right through their back facing the facing the wall this kind of picture I will never forget as a child is still in my mind so when I opened the door the front door of my house I saw this horrible scene what I saw and of course I saw my my brothers were among those men and I just went down uh, to hug my brother and kiss my brother. And that's at that point, that's when we left and we were forced to leave after that as a child, losing uh, right in my front of my eyes, my father and my two brothers. After that, we left and we came to Lebanon. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Hey, boys. Hey. 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 Local NGOs provide networking and advocacy for preserving Palestinian heritage and Palestinian rights, especially the right to return. Thank you very much. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. We drive south along the Mediterranean Sea, then head east to the Bekaa Valley region. El Jalil camp, also called Weyvel camp, was once a French army barracks. It is located in the Bekaa Valley, very near the historic city of Baalbek. Camp residents in 1948 were housed by the French and later in 1952 came under the authority of UNRWA for health care and educational services. UNRWA documentation registers Palestinians in the camp where they first arrived as refugees. Subsequent displacements are not reflected in identity documents. Boy, were you here, Nabil? No, I've never been here. Never been here. Oh. That's my first time. Oh. Even though my document says I was born here. Oh. Most Palestinians uh, who live in Tel Zatar initially came here. Yeah. Then they, when Tel Zatar was uh, established, a lot of people start going to Beirut for work. So the uh, the source where you registered initially with Inerwa kept uh, was uh, as a form of document. So doesn't matter where you were born. The 
official uh, where your parents were registered initially goes as birth, your birth of uh, place, birth place. So my family lived in Beirut in Tel at the time, but, and I was born in Tel but my document says that I was born in Second Edoro, <laughs> which, is which is here. Uh, I mean, it's uh, only one mile off. <laughs> Inadequate health services offered by UNRWA and inflated costs of private medical care result in a permanent health crisis for the Palestinian refugee community. The severe health situation is reflected in a high neonatal infant mortality rate and high rates of childhood illness and malnutrition. We meet Dr. Raja Muslih, medical director of a program providing training for nurses as well as health care for the community. Uh, here in Bika we have three projects. We have mother and child, and we have clinic and we have nutrition training. And we have a uh, kindergarten where we have about 162 children from three until six. And we are working here between Lebanese and Palestinian. And it's very nice that Palestinian and Jew, not working only for Palestinian, working for Lebanese and Palestinian. It means the relation between Palestinian and, and uh, Lebanese is very strong, and we haven't in this area any problem between the Palestinian and uh, Lebanese. <laughs> And this center was opened only months ago. It's a brand new. <laughs> they have 70 children. Uh, uh, come from 42 families. And what uh, services? Uh, they are social. They offer social work with them. Uh, support. Uh, social support. They do summer after-school programs and summer programs. Here in Al Jalil camp, as with other refugee camps, embroidery workshops using traditional Palestinian design motifs provide some financial assistance to the community. Three miles from the Lebanese city of Tyre is the Burj al Shimali camp. Here, there are 20,000 residents who came from the regions of Hawla and Tiberias in historic Palestine. Today, Lebanese authorities surround the camp and prohibit any construction materials from being brought in. As a consequence, the camp remains a squalid, deteriorating ghetto, socially, physically and economically isolated from the Lebanese society. On June 7, 1982, the Israeli army dropped a phosphorus bomb on a shelter in Burj al shimali camp, killing 93 people who had sought refuge inside. This has been called the Al Hula Massacre or the Forgotten Massacre. We join with camp residents and international visitors to commemorate this event with a wreath laying ceremony.
الفاتحة Thank you all. Thank you all to visit our camp. Thank you. Mar Elias camp is the smallest of the refugee camps in Lebanon with 1,500 residents. It was established in 1952 to accommodate refugees from the Galilee region of northern Palestine. Here, as in the other camps, there is a high incidence of chronic diseases, hypertension, cancer, and diabetes. And as in the other camps, there is a lack of medical treatment available. Originally, many of the Mar Elias refugees came from Christian communities in Palestine. All Palestinian refugees in Lebanon are deprived of civil and social rights. Thank uh...